And let's go backstage to our host, Robert Jacobson. The great prima donnas of the early 19th century who sang roles such as Anna Bolena started not as sopranos, but as mezzos. Dame Joan Sutherland, too, began as a mezzo. When I met with her at the Knickerbocker in Chicago a few days ago, I asked her if she continues this tradition. High extension. And I know that you did begin as a mezzo-soprano, and your mother was a fabulous mezzo from everything I can tell. Do you see yourself as having built the voice in similar fashion? I don't really think that it was built that much. I think that the voice was always there. I think the actual physical equipment, the vocal cords, were capable of doing that. I didn't think they were, and because my mother was a mezzo-soprano, and because we had all that music in the house, and because she was terrified, I think, of doing any damage to the voice, because mm. she did perceive that there was something a bit sort of special maybe there, um, she didn't want to extend the voice uh, and, and do any damage before a certain age. She said that I shouldn't really work on the voice before I was 18, and I think she was right because um, I, th I think the proof of, of her guidance is there insofar as it's been a long time <laughs> since I made my debut. <laughs> yes. mm. so I think it was also granted the fact that, that <coughs> Joan has a, a, a big voice. It was very wise and very fortunate that she, she began as a mezzo-soprano because she, she started singing with the voice centred low. And I think this is very important when you are singing the bel canto repertoire because if you have a voice which is centered high and, and is, is, uh, is, is lighter, you, you, you can't yeah, you produce the emotion that is required for this hefty role. You started out with, with basically a core of a voice, yes. and you went from there, but you had to be convinced. Oh, well, Richard had to convince <laughs> me. I mean, the only way he convinced me was, was the fact that I, I have what, well, I, I don't have perfect pitch, I have relative pitch, um, and he would make me get away from the piano and, and, and really tricked me into, into accepting that I could sing the higher register notes, that, that I could sing in a higher tessitura. Um, I had been working up to it by singing, I guess, some of the, the handle pieces had, had taken the voice into, into a tessitura that sat high, mm -hmm. and some of the, the Mozart sits in a high area. But I, I never really essayed to sing the straight out um, so-called coloratura roles. Um, I didn't think of myself singing sort of high E's and, and F's, although I actually have sung an F sharp, haven't I? In, <laughs> in public? <laughs> Never in public. Well, she's sung high F's in public many times, but the, the F sharp she's talking about you was very much a private affair. She got in a, in a, in a very wild rage with me one day because she was quite sure that I was ruining her voice by putting it up there and she shrieked an F-sharp to prove that she couldn't. Mm. <laughs> only, she, only she could. So that was the end of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we throw around this term bel canto and we've been doing it for decades and decades and essentially it means beautiful singing. But don't That's you, what it is. But don't you feel though that it, it means having at your command uh, at your disposal, everything imaginable and everything possible in the vocal artillery. Uh, yes, it does. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you've worked. I mean, you've spent a lifetime developing that artillery, so to speak, so that it's all possible. But you know, the older I, I become, the more I, I think that bel canto is not only beautiful singing. I think that's the basis of bel canto. But I think a singer that shows that all they think about is beautiful singing brings about the death of bel canto because all the bel canto the bel canto has to be very dramatic and has to be very alive and this is this is more than singing vocally mm. so is, it's this phrasing is, this and is create, yes, it's creating mm. living characters living characters who sing gloriously that's mm. bel canto but don't you think it comes through phrasing and coloration it's and all, dramatic all, effects all part of it all part of it and, and, and a supreme technique which should never be the, the public shouldn't be aware of a singer placing notes or of or showing how difficult a thing is in fact it should it should seem fairly easy. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people say when Joan sings that it looks so easy. Well, it's not, but, but that, that, that's, that's the trick <laughs> that's to, make the it, to make it seem easy. It should <laughs> seem easy. Well, it's interesting. On a recent uh, documentary about Sir Laurence Olivier, he said that acting is technique and that technique should be the prime consideration of any actor because it then gives that actor versatility. This is true, this but it, the technique must not be shown to the public. Yes. I'm technique, sure he didn't let the technique he, show. No, but he was accused sometimes. Sometimes. Of the, by the critics of 
letting that technique show and come across as his first consideration. And that was one of the things that um, critics uh, had think, him I for. I think in his great roles, he didn't show the technique. And in sometimes, I, I think that in some of your critiques, they've said, well, you know, she's a technical marvel, but, and then, then there were all the, the yes buts, and maybe there are not enough words, there's not enough theater, or whatever, in, in, in past times. Well, no, you but can't may, please maybe, everybody. Maybe at times, maybe at times she did show the technique. Too much, <laughs> but, the, but the technique must be there. But in a way, that's the beginning of it all, because you can't go out on raw emotion and perform basic absolutely not well, it's, the pub it's the, the public that have act. to feel the, the emotion the public must be absolutely destroyed by emotion but not the singer on stage because how can they possibly control all the time because singing is control very much they have to control the throat they have to control the diaphragm they have to control the breath they must only control and control the mind and if you have to control your own mind, mind in order to control the the public's mind well that's why i guess we've seen a number of people fall by the wayside and the fact that the whole battery of things hasn't been in order and you you have kept yours in order not only in order but i just think it I've gets tried. better I've, and better i would say that it's always in order i mean some some nights one is capable of doing much more than one is on others and 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 uh, it has always been thus um no matter how how technically proficient you may be you will always have nights when you just it just clicks that much more than others. And sometimes they're not the nights when you think it's clicking that much more than others either. Well, just because Richard... So you just don't know. Richard said because you don't hear yourself. And in That's a way, right. uh, you, really you can be giving a completely different performance than you're hearing in your, in yes, your head. Yes, you can, you, can, you, can, you can feel when everything gels the way you want it to. And it's not very often. <laughs> <laughs> but Dame Joan, it's no secret that you've been singing in the uh, public eye since the early 1950s. How do you account for these many, many wonderful years on the stage and also maintaining such a high level along the way? Um, I think I've been fairly disciplined. Um, I've set myself certain restrictions. Um, we never sort of traveled backwards and forwards on a jet from one place to another too fast. I mean, if you had a concert tour, you had a concert tour and you, you, you did the rounds. But um, if I've been recording, I've mostly just been recording. I haven't been singing an opera, say, in London at the same time. Um, I have colleagues who come to recording sessions flying in from other cities. And I find I can't, never could do it. I, I became disoriented. I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure where I was, and I wasn't quite sure what opera I was singing. And um, one had a, a, a sort of a detached feeling <laughs> up there. And I didn't like it, so I, I, I never really tried to do more than one thing on the whole at a time. I have done recording while I have been um, singing at Covent Garden, but I have stayed in London all the time, and um, I, I think it paid off. So I think the jet has a lot to answer for. She also sang in the right repertoire for, exactly. for most of her life. I think, I think that's very important, that, because, you know, singing... Donizetti and, and, and Rossini and Bellini, it, it's like uh, medicine for the voice all the time. And it's kept the voice high, in, basically high in placement and on uh, healthy. The on the contrary, it's no. kept the middle in good The order. middle, okay. And it's the middle of the voice which is the, the most important the part of, of the, the voice. voice. Is the, is if you're middle of, of the, the middle of your thing. voice is in good order, you'll be able to do whatever your voice is capable of, which is sing high notes or low notes. But if, you, if your middle is not in good order, then you can forget the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's what so, so many young singers today, I hear them before performances, they are screaming and practicing their high notes all night in the dressing room. If you have As a good technique, you wear the high out. notes will be there. You have to have faith in the, that they will be there. If you've got the middle under control, then the, the bottom and the, and the top should follow. Yes. Um, I don't go too much towards the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one does hear them trying out their high notes all the time. And I've, if I did that, I would feel as though I'd have nothing left by the end of the performance. It becomes kind of a preoccupation. The it's a certain nervosity. It, it, it's, it's a certain People are worried sort of they won't be there. But, they, but, they, you know, but, you but either be they're sure there or they 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 not. There. It's, yeah. it's, it's the old story of, of Bjerling saying, you know, that he, d he didn't warm up. That um, if he was well, he didn't need to. And if he wasn't well, it wasn't going to do any good <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. So. <laughs> I'm a bit like that myself. I, 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 I do a few, few phrases, but no excessive warming up at all. I sing the sort of roles that give me plenty of exercise <laughs> on the voice anyway. <laughs> Dame Joan, what in the whole 
bel canto artillery, what was the hardest thing for you to master? What gave you the most problems? Was it learning how to trill or? Oh, no, trill was always there. Mm -hmm. I, I never really had to learn how to trill. <laughs> <laughs> what didn't um, come naturally? I really... I, legato. I suppose a, a, a legato line in the upper register. No, in the middle register. <laughs> <laughs> you mean in knitting a whole series of notes together in a very I, meaningful I, I, well, phrase. Well, I mean, it, it, to a certain extent, but my, my mother had always said that you had to, although that there might be a, a middle and, a, and an upper and a lower register, they all had to be joined together without any bumps or seams showing. And um, I tried it, and I thought I was doing quite well, but he tells me that it was... No, it's a pretty rocky. Fact, I, a little I, lumpy. <laughs> I think it's very interesting when, you, when one looks back. I think she, she used to sing with a very uh, rather unlegato, rather Germanic style in, in the beginning, and then and, and then the looking for the and then looking for the for the this wonderful legato line. I think that was the cause of all, all, all the, the mushy addiction, <laughs> which, which we, we, we got hold over the coals for. So you can never years. win, right? So you can't win. <laughs> I, think, I think in the last sort of ten years we've managed to balance it out much more. But they still but talk about the <laughs> But it's, uh, you know, that all these are problems. Singers are, f are always going to find problems, and mm. the problems don't run, they don't go away even when you become very, very famous. Well, it's very difficult to enunciate in the, in the high areas of, of the voice. You, you cannot. Also without you either making a bump, or, or if, you, if, you, if you don't enunciate, you might get a better legato uh, uh, line, but uh, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. But spinning out a seamless line and getting every consonant is a difficult well, combination. Well, we try for perfection, mm. but, but, you know, it's... It's never quite there. Um, but certain vowels make more beautiful sounds. And, uh, I mean, the A, a in, speaking in English, the A and the O vowels make the most beautiful sounds. The E and I vowels tend to be Squeezed. harder and, 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 and uh, not, not, not so round. And um, Garcia, in, in his treatise, says you should sing all, all credential passages, all, all runs of any description, no matter what word you're singing, on the A vowel. A vowel, yes. Um, but you do that today, then you're criticised for having bad diction. So where, <laughs> where are you? you are, Just you say sing, you're doing do you vocalises. Sing, do you sing bel canto, <laughs> or do you... Do you one, one, to be quite honest, one has to make compromise. Modern taste. As the years go on with such spectacular singing, does it get easier or harder? I think in the... It, from the learning point of view, because one doesn't learn as fast, and I never did learn that fast anyway, it becomes harder. But I think from the performing point of view, one, one is much more relaxed about it. One isn't so tense. One um, feels that you, you can only accomplish so much. And although the, the audience, I think, expects a little more than they should. Mm -hmm. I, I think one has become a little bit too much of a, of a, of a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but one doesn't worry about the performance as, as much and I think that helps too mm -hmm. because it gives you a much, a much better basis on, on which to get out there and, and do it. You know, I look at your face and I see these wonderful high cheekbones and these res obviously these great resonating cavities. Have you ever always felt that you're physique and everything was made for singing? Is oh, I think so. I, I, I think it's, again, it's a, it's a hand-me-down from my mother and, and the Scots ancestry to a certain extent. Um, even some of my, my nieces and nephews have similar features and uh, I, I, I think it has got a great deal to do with it. I think there are great, there is a great resonating um, um, cavity Chamber there. Well, I, I think there is. And, and what else is important? Is the high palate um, important? No, no, this is the, definitely. I, I, I have got a very high palate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what about the... Big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> big mouth. <laughs> oh, definitely. The, the, I have a marvelous chest cavity as well. Too. And the diaphragm for good, support. Good diaphragmatic support. And there we are. Don't let's get on to singing to you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems that uh, from what you've said and what I've read that you started out with a tremendous gift of nature and that was what you had in the in the two little oh, it was there. chords it was there but that everything else uh, took tremendous application and tremendous diligence and that you really didn't take anything for granted or maybe you couldn't take anything for granted well i certainly wasn't allowed to take anything <laughs> for granted once i i met and married him <laughs> there was no there was there was no sort of backsliding permitted um, I mean, he kept the standard oh, up. Oh, yes, yes. And, you know, I think with, with singers, they're 
in the unfortunate position of not being able to hear themselves as the public hears them. I mean, no singer hears what they do. This I mean, is true. today they tend to, to trust a little bit to tape recorders and things like that, but even that gives them a very false impression of what they sound like, and, and, and it gives them a false impression very often of the size of their voice. Yes. You know, and, and I think every singer needs somebody to just listen because faults creep in all the time. It doesn't matter what the, who the singer is. I mean, there's no, no singer in this world is, is or ever has been perfect. In fact, it's very amusing when singers, young singers, come along and, and sing to one for auditions. You know, you frequently can spot exactly who they've been copying, whose oh, yes. records, <laughs> because they not only copy the virtues, they copy all the faults as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been, uh, among other things, a monitor along oh, the... Oh, very uh, definitely. Suppose, so, yeah. Very definitely. In hearing what's happening with the voice. And have you been able to see a great deal of change in Dame Jones' voice over these years? Oh, I think it's, it's become much, much warmer, much more, much, much more uh, a th a thicker and, and bigger voice as, as she got older. And uh, I think it's a, it's a, the voice contains much more emotion now than it used to. I, f I find it a more, to me, it's a more interesting voice because it has many more facets now. Maybe it's because we just think it's, that it's it can't go on forever, <laughs> so we can try a few more desperate things. What drives you on? Just the fact that people keep offering interesting projects? Oh, well, also perhaps the idea that one might get bored. I don't know. I don't see how I could vaguely get bored because I have several interests and I, w I would like to be, have the feeling that I could, could pursue those without worrying about whether I caught a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Do you both feel a little bit of uh, weight of responsibility at this point in time. I mean, in, in a way, you've created your own era. The post-Maria Callas period has certainly been the era of Joan Sutherland and the Donatetti, Bellini, uh, Rossini repertory. And in some ways, the Bel Canto revival wanes and ebbs and comes and goes. But you are kind of the, the Parnassus of uh, Bel Canto at this point, And you've created a, a heritage. Have you felt your position in history at I, all? I think the responsibility r rests with, with uh, people having paid out a heck of a lot of money to travel. Sometimes they travel from the other side of the United States or something and come to a performance and they have not that much. They're, they're, they're paying for tickets out and fares out of their own income. I think the responsibility is, is, is to the public. I don't think either Richard or I have ever thought of ourselves as, as educators at all. I think we've people come to to be entertained. More entertainers. And, and, and exactly. We don't like ourselves if they don't like us. We, know. <laughs> no. um, we hope that they enjoy the performance that they've paid for and, and that's the responsibility. You seem very focused on what you want and what you're after and you go and do it. Well, we're, we're both very, very lucky to have been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What about that stubbornness when it comes to uh, working together? Oh, if someone has to give in, it's usually me. <laughs> <laughs> this program is made possible by a grant from Exxon. Exxon, quality you can count on in the performing arts. This program is also made possible by grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Listen, there's something in the air. It is music and dance and comedy and tragedy. It is the 12th exciting season of great performances on your public television station. It is Ubin Mater conducting the New York Philharmonic, the sparkling innovations of the American Ballet Theater, the splendor of opera with Pavarotti and Domingo, and drama at its richest, from Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse to the hilarious You Can't Take It With You. And it is the grace of Varishnikov and Tharp, the magic of Lena Horne, the whimsy of Alice in Wonderland. It is great performances, television's longest running celebration of the lively arts and the artists and performers who make our world a richer place. You won't want to miss a single evening in the exciting 12th season of Great Performances, shown each Friday on your public television station, brought to you in part by Exxon. This is live from Lincoln Center, coming to you from the stage of Avery Fisher Hall in New York Performing Arts. And we're presenting in concert the opera Anna Bolena by Gaetano Donizetti. The only new 
character whom we meet in the second act is Sir Harvey, the King's officer, who will be sung by tenor Grand Wilson. Richard Bonning conducts the New York City Opera Orchestra, Act Two of Donizetti's Anna Bolena.
colpo è sceso e lo scaglio si ascolta come accio smetton cadea nel carcer suo ritorno il giovinceco e a creder seguo ancora fin che sospesa è l'ora della vendetta mia d'aver salvata dannala Pressa. E quinci vien condotto per sì, fra suoi custodi. Si eviti. Oh, 
con viltà giò releva, egli confessa, e cento ne aguce testimonio. Tocci, 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 a queste di qualcosa, e a genita di prendo, ed altamente di dismetan seduttor, te si io grido.
alla tremenda legge che la condanna mia colpevole moglie che sia pur ver la coglie legge non mentrenda e la sua figlia Ravvolgentessa nella sua ruina. Sire, vieni sei morto, sei regina. Oh, sire, il mio rimorso vi guida il vostro bene. Rimorso. Deliri, the don 
Quando in te si strano proposto, o oh donna, e speri tu, partendo Anna far salva, io ti ho lavoro adesso, la porra più e si t'affligge torba, e a spegner giunge il tuo medesimo amore.
cellulare si han fatti prigionieri.
After fainting, Anne Boleyn is led to the executioner's block. And so ends Anna Bolena, the opera by Gaetano Donizetti, brought to you live from Lincoln Center from the stage of Avery Fisher Hall. Our Anna Bolena, Anne Boleyn, was Dame Joan Sutherland. 
and the conductor, Richard Bonning. Our other principals were Judith Forst as Jane Seymour, Jerry Hadley as Lord Richard Percy, Gregory Urisich as King Henry VIII, Cynthia Clary as Smeaton, the Queen's page, Jan Opelok as Lord Rochefort and Boleyn's brother, and Gran Wilson as Sir Harvey, the King's officer. There is our King, Gregory Urisich, our Jane Seymour, Judith Forrest, and the musicians of the New York City Opera, playing here on the stage of Avery Fisher Hall under the direction of Richard Bonning. This presentation will take to the road, so to speak. There will be two further performances, one in Boston next Sunday at the Wang Center, and then on Friday, December 6th, at the Kennedy Center in Washington. The role of Anne Boleyn, one of the great ones in the bel canto repertory. A particular specialty of J Dame Joan Sutherland. And there was a remarkable revival of the opera, which was given in 1956. And the Anne Boleyn in that presentation was Maria Callas. A production given in Donizetti's native city of Bergamo in Italy. Here, led on by Dame Joan Sutherland, are our principals. And I might add that the presentations in Boston and Washington will feature the same singers whom we heard here in New York City this evening on Live from Lincoln Center. And speaking of Live from Lincoln Center, let me tell you about the next two programs in this series. Very shortly after the new year, on Monday evening, January 6th, will be our next presentation, and that will be Pavarotti Plus. Luciano Pavarotti in concert with nine American opera stars, sopranos Kathleen Battle, Susan Dunn, Mary Jane Johnson, and Carol Van Es. Mezzo-soprano Dolores Ziegler, tenor Jerry Hadley again, baritones Simon Estes and Alan Titus, and bass James Morris. And they will perform opera selections from solo arias to sextets. Monday evening, January 6th. On Sunday afternoon, January 12th, the presentation by the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center with Irene Wirth and Horacio Gutierrez. The program will be music by Saint-Saëns, Beethoven, Satie, and Brahms. This is Martin Buxban. Good evening. Listen. There's something in the air. It is music and dance and comedy and tragedy. It is the 12th exciting season of great performances on your public television station. It is Ubin Mater conducting the New York Philharmonic, the sparkling innovations of the American Ballet Theater, the splendor of opera with Pavarotti and Domingo, and drama at its richest, from Virginia Woolf's to the Lighthouse to the hilarious You Can't Take It With You. And it is the grace of the rich.